for and see they do this. What? Back to Wula. Back to Wula. Back to Wula. 2016 stats of the political, it's not political violence, it's violence and murder, of people killing each other over council positions in the ANC were 500. The most dangerous position in South Africa to hold is the position of a director general, head of department, CEO of a parastatal. When you hold those positions, by CEO post office. And if you get the job and you want to be an activist and you fight, you're out. This is the Hustlers Corner. Hello guys, welcome to the Hustlers Corner. We're quite excited once again. It's another exciting episode of Virtual Mkuku, which happens on the Hustlers Corner. Guys, the first thing we do on this platform, as usual, we go straight to that shop shop sign on the count of one, two, three, click, 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 click. Click. Thank you very much. And then we we'll go to this side, click the subscription button, click. Don't forget to switch on that <laughs> notification bell so you get to be informed when we drop new videos. I'm quite excited once again. I'm back with my homie Peño. How you doing, God? Peep? Virtual cool with DJ Smuda. Yeah, Are you, you good? Grand. No, no, I'm very good. Uh, well, besides that, we've been dealing with a new natural state of disaster, Wazulu, uh, the loss of life, and all those things, which is very sad. Outside of that, me personally, my family, we're all good. So I'm, I'm good. How are the kids? Kids are great. Uh, I speak to them on a regular basis. I've got two in China, I've got two in Durban, I've got one here in Joburg and one in Newcastle. They're growing and I can't wait to work with them growing up. That's incredible. Same here, man. Um, I was very touched about what happened last week. Yeah. Um, our hearts go to everybody that has lost their belongings, whether yeah. it's your car, your home, your house especially people who've lost their lives or people who've lost their loved ones. Um, we've heard the government saying they're organizing some sort of aid. Mm -hmm. We've heard some people who are privileged enough to assist with a cent O2. We've seen um, organizations, NGO, just a lot of people going down to go and assist in KZN. And um, we appreciate your help. Um, congratulations to the ones that have raised their hand to say we will assist. The person that we're sitting with is one of the most amazing, brightest minds in South Africa. And um, she is a chartered public relations practitioner with a cum laude BTEC PR management, national diploma, certification in PR, in governance, as well as in public leadership. She is an entrepreneur, high achiever, who holds 28 years of blue chip exposure to the information and technology space, financial services, mining and metals, agriculture, transport and logistics, ports, aviation, travel, tourism, media. She has been at it. Jeez. She's been hustling. <laughs> Legislative Jeez. and political sectors. She has held senior leadership roles since the early onset of her career in both private and the public sector service earning an inviolable success record across industries and functions. She is a business generalist with extensive board and C-suite exposure, complemented by proven skills in... Um, Jeez, man, this is very long. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> you can it's stop. A lot. <laughs> this is just only the beginning. Yeah? Yo. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to welcome Mandi Sa. Sibongi le Mashejo San Bonanijan Siswame. Just two secrets or two whatevers from my side. Firstly, I'm a I'm a huge, huge groupie of Umandisa. Uh, I've been tracking her for the last couple of years. The second secret is there was a time when she was running for provincial leadership uh, in the province. And at that time, I didn't know who she was. So unfortunately, I voted for the wrong party at that time. But I made it a mission to go and find out who is this lady and why does she deserve to run this entire province? And ever since then, I think I've been hooked and I'm super excited to be chatting to her today. And which province was that? This one, yeah, the <laughs> province of gold, the Gauteng. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So she was also in politics. Yeah. I, I'm hoping she'll speak to us a bit about that today, so I'm quite excited. Sanbonan Ninjan Siswam. Sia Pira Dijan Siso. Thank you very much for giving us your time, Sia Bonga Rakul. No, get Chabla Namugu Banan. It's so great to see you. Maybe for people who are who are watching from home, um Ubanu Sismandi Sasbungi Le Mashekhu. And um where did you grow up? What's your background? Yeah, I was born in King Williamstown at Kone, but I was literally just born there. Raised in Pumalanga. Uh, went to school in Pumalanga, Gauteng, KZN, 
Uh, my parents are really old people. My dad is like 93, he's still alive. I live with him, or he lives with me, rather. Wow, Jeez. your dad is, your dad is 93. Jeez. Yes, congratulations. Too, thank you very much. Ngambongela. He had you late, no? Ngambongela. Yeah, I think he was in his 40s. Okay. Uh. In his 40s. My mom is also retired. Lalewit Bank Kaya back home. Um, I have a 28. I think she'll be 29 this year. Your old daughter. She's in the States somewhere. 29. Living her best life. Jeez. <laughs> as they age. as they put it. Hey, that age in her 20s, yo. I mean, I've yeah, lived yo, my best I, life. I look like now, Michelle. Now, ne? No, no, no. By young as a bad young as a coolie. This is not the same. You know, I'm I'm not regrets. Gabu, Gabu, Shabu, 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 Shabu. What can Gabu do? I'm not obsessed with Kona. I'm not going far. I'm not going far. I'm not going to do anything. I don't want any high fives. No. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I don't have it. And yeah, essentially that's that. I mean, I've done a whole lot of stuff. I'm an activist, I think, at heart. Because I think also being born rural and raised rural. I mean, even the schools I went to were rural. I went to Barberton as well. All Catholic schools, you know, the Catholic missionary school phase. You know, we went to Catholic missionary schools in the 80s. Or to Maufige Kaya during school holidays, other kids would come. School Melanie Slum. I'm from that brigade. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, one had a very uh, dynamic upbringing. My dad was um, probably the first, if not only, specialist in power generation. Knowledge was black. As far back, I think he started off in the 50s, if not the 60s, working yeah. for a company called Babcock. He worked there for like a good 50 years back in the day when parents, you know, when you could still keep a job for that long. Mm. Babcock is still around, by the way. My mom worked for OK Bazaars and ShopRite for like 40 odd years. Yeah. So I come from a, a hardcore working class background, but I was raised by very indigenous uh, parents. I mean, grandparents, because back in the day, even if your parents were married, they would go into the urban areas and then your parents would leave you with your grandparents so that Ufunde is seen. No took tarat. When I moved to Joburg, I, I discovered that Joburg of urbanized black people. Yeah. But Sekoli didn't quite understand the difference. And really, their perspective of African culture is very diff diff different to mine. You see this kid on, on, on the back of the old lady, you know, wow. literally for nine years in Kulele Masimi. I went to school in Asafun, because we Masimi is better. Some people who understand the education space say it's better to learn anything practically. Yeah. So the African way of teaching and learning, oral, you know, transmission of information. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter, it could be mathematics, uh, what do you call it, is astronomy or astrology, I can never distinguish the two. Science, it's best to learn anything practically. So, I'm today because I'm going to say, by the age of two, I'm going So I would replicate whatever my grandmother is doing there. No pesticides, no chemicals. Everything natural, complement planting, jala log na logo, ubuzele, koshe le, sluane le, koshe le si. You know, so that's basically me in a nutshell. I think at, as I get older, I'm sort of going back to my roots mm -hmm. a lot more. I've just come back on Tuesday from Umsebe in Zekaya, Eastern Cape. Mm -hmm. um, my ancestral land is, or if you know the Shamwari Game Reserve, that's Shamwari. Yeah, I think I've heard of it. That's basically my family's land. So some of my the old people in my family still mm. live literally right on the doorstep of the Shamwari entrance. Mm. They literally still have those mud houses, but very nicely done up. Mm. And it was just such a spiritual exercise, you know, it was so beautiful. So I went from King Williamstown, mm. and I flew back. So you're a fully fledged South African because you've lived in pretty much you grew up in what like Everywhere. three or four provinces yeah. yeah yeah and you've you've sort of had a bit of the uh bit of both lives rural five. life and the township life also yeah and the suburban life yeah <laughs> that's why i say you're a fully fledged South African. no in fact i'm one of those kids i moved to the suburbs when i was 18 on my own me and my friend you? we just didn't want to stay in the township because you know going to boarding so i went from the rural areas, I spent two years in the township with my mom, I hated it, because it's confined spaces. Lang Kulele Kona, it's a village called Mayfen. Oh, by the way, another interesting thing about what I'm doing now, and I've, it's just literally dawned on me. I'm busy with land claims on both sides of my family, paternally and maternally. So the village where we grew up, is called a Mayfen in Elspreet. That's, um, if you know the Halls Farms, 
Leo holds Emata, the truth. The holds, yes. Those are Ematafen. So Ematafen mm -hmm. was the farm adjacent to ours, which is Mayfen, which is also massive and huge. They exported mainly. And so we, we're busy reviving, uh, resuscitating the land claim because there was a lot of corruption and the wrong people were awarded. So we're going back to fight for our land. On my mother's side, Eshamwari, we're also going back. And I'm also going to try and mount an unheard of class action lawsuit against the White family that fathered my mother and a few other children in my mother's family there on the farm. I want damages, I want uh, colonial reparations, and I want, uh, you know, dignity reparations. Uh, in the townships, for lack of a better word, somebody, else, somebody would ask a question that I would like to ask, but yeah. framing it in a township way, people yeah. would say, Utumengan. So, Mina, as I hear, and, and I won't say Utumenga logo, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I would ask you, Penuel was saying to me, you are a fully fledged activist. Yeah. What you would like to be referred to as, because I wouldn't want to offend you. I don't I know, maybe a womanist, maybe a womanist. What's the difference between an activist, a womanist, and a feminist? Well, if you're a womanist and a feminist, you're an activist, right? You're an activist, you're an activist, we're all activists. Anybody basically is an activist who's passionate enough about something to actually want to get up and do something about it mm. without any sense of fear or, you know, trepidation or, you know, hesitation or whatever. Um, whether you're right or wrong, you're, as an activist, you are constantly trying to push boundaries. You're never mm. satisfied. You never reach a point where you say, okay, I've attained this, I've done this. And so I wouldn't know what people would want to remember me for. I mean, I know I spent lots of years in corporate and every company I worked at, I basically, you know, pushed some doors. I, mean, problems. I, I had a, a very notorious image at one of the companies I worked at in um, back home in Pumalanga, Kruger and Pumalanga International Airport. It was built by a Swedish-American consortium. Mm. It's not a government uh, airport. Um, but when I left, there was a, a little urban legend that I slapped the MD. So that's how hectic I must have been, because I didn't slap the guy. <laughs> oh, didn't. No, I didn't. Okay. But it was it was something that you know just grew in the in the yeah. industry. It's like, hey, no, I John, Jeez. So I'm just saying that's how hectic I was. You know, yeah. I would basically stand up for myself, even when it meant I would lose a job. I've always constantly done that. And essentially, I think now having, you know, I'm older now, I'm 48, I think I'm quite better rounded than I was when I was much younger, when being push and Jay passion, yeah, my struggles. Well, I mean, now I've got a lot more sort of, not intellectual, but a much more long, you know, view about my struggles. And so I'm a lot more um, focused on very specific industries. Like for instance, one of the things that I'm, working on now is to get into the recycling space because I'm very passionate about the environment. I'm a bit of a tree hugger, you know. Hey, tree hugger. <laughs> tree huggers international. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I want to get into it. So I want to do work that basically has a, a sound contribution in society. So I don't want to just work and earn a living. If everybody, anybody, we all work and earn a living. But I don't believe in earning a living in a toxic space. Mm. And I do believe that the world is currently in an evolution, also a spiritual evolution. Um, and none of us will escape it. It's obvious. You can see it in climate change. You can see it in this uh, planned epidemic here, COVID. You can see it in South Africa. You can see it in the you know, crude and crass and extremely violent um, incidents of uh, you know, abuse against girl children and boy children, but women predominantly. You can see it in the crass, um, you know, uh, imperialistic, uh, you know, uh, aggression. Uh, imperialism, by the way, if you understand what imperialism is, in the context that it is an, a culmination of capitalistic wars for territories, like in the drug space, in the, in the illicit drug space, mm. you know, drug lords will fight over territories. Mm. It's the same in any other industry in the capitalist space. So once a company has captured, let's make Big Pharma an example because of COVID, once a company has captured a certain market in a certain geography, capitalism says no continue, there's no limits to what I can accumulate as a private shareholder. And so they start fighting over territories and turfs, mm. and that's imperialism. So when this company says, no, we want to dominate Africa, when they get to Africa, they find another pharmaceutical company that's dominated by Olua. You know, then it's industrial espionage. It's this and that, it's this and that. In the mining sector, in every industry, it happens. So 
my thing right now is that I do not want to find myself doing anything, whether as an activist or as an entrepreneur, that is going to contribute towards that toxicity mm. of imperialism, which is basically just a very crass uh, and out of control escalation of capitalism. I think we're just going to have a very open conversation about anything. Yeah. I love the fact that your mind is very broad and you're a very um, well-traveled, well-educated um, sister. I love that because I get Thank to learn you. a lot from people who are more smarter than me. I love hanging out with people. I'm not smarter than you. Well, well, I love I'm definitely not smarter than you. You're, smart, you're, smarter, you're definitely smarter than me. You, you, you make a lot more money than me. That makes you oh, smarter. That doesn't matter. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is, I, like, I prefer hanging out with people who are smarter than me. That's why he's sitting here. I me just, too. Even my business partners, I'm just surrounded by people who are cleverer than me. It's better. Like, I'm always like that. It's I better. like that. You, so, you need fewer consultants when you do that. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> to save money. So, to save money, you, 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 must, mar advice. you must marry an accountant or marry a, a, yeah. a lawyer. A lawyer. <laughs> exactly. You I'm don't have scientist. to put anything on the side. <laughs> yeah. So, an interesting one is, in your, in your talk right now, yeah. you, 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 you could have just easily spoke about Big, big Pharma and yeah. spoke about the pandemic and yeah. kept it moving. But you didn't say pandemic, you said planned yeah. pandemic. What, what, what do you mean? So I'm an anti-vaxxer and I think a lot of people that I talk with via social media, etc. are aware of that. I've also made my private citizen submission to the National Department of Health uh, to object to the draconian and really new world order um, amendments or regulations, amendments to the regulations contained in the um, Health Act. Okay, before you continue, Africa. your private citizen total rejection letter says, this is my proposed amend, oh, this is the proposed amendment National Health Act that we we're talking about yeah. on the previous episode last week, yeah. right? It says, dear all, I trust this email receives you well. Please find attached my rejection yeah. as a private citizen yeah. of the following South African government slash health ministers proposed amendments to the National Health Act 2003 yeah. published in the government gazette under the following link. Yeah. Now, can you please, because I, I love that conversation that we touched on then because it affects everyone, even who's sure. watching. I would like for us to, um, to, to link both conversations. And in her own words, I'd like for her also to explain what this National Health Act is. Yeah. And um, I don't know if it's already too late or what people out there can they do. Can they also still uh, participate in these private, private citizen um, total rejection emails? Um, I remember the initial deadline for citizens and whoever else, other stakeholders, organized uh, non-government organizations, community-based organizations, anybody really. I think even a corporation could, because corporations in the South African constitution or the law of South Africa are classified as citizens. Yeah. So they could also, you know. But I think the initial deadline was the 16th. Of April, the 16th yeah. was on, true, no, was on Saturday, I can't remember. Mm. I know 19th. But it was Saturday. the 16th it was of the April. 16th. Yeah. And there were discussions to have it uh, extended. Of everything that goes through the National Assembly and your parliament in South Africa gets extended because in South Africa we just have a terrible habit of just not meeting deadlines. But beyond that, it's the sinister motives um, behind this entire thing that also drove some activists. Uh, I know a few, a couple of political parties who were bold enough to become anti-vaxxers and be clear about it. Because uh, it's, it's true, you must, you must fight a struggle when it's not romantic yet, when it's not yet popular, when everybody's like, oh, it's good to be an anti-vaxxer because you won't be able to travel, etc., or get a job. Uh, but I know people were fighting to, for it to be extended. I'm not sure. I'm, I hope they did manage to extend it. Because they have extended. They have. Yeah. Oh. To what date? Yeah. I, I think it might be May. It should be. Okay, so what can the public do? So what the public must do, okay, so let me explain just uh, why it's critical for us as citizens to reject the proposed amendments. Because they are not amendments, they are proposed. And um, they are amendments to the regulations, but regulations sit within the, the, the ambit of the Act. And the Act becomes law, because it's a national Act of Parliament. And it becomes law, and to amend a law then becomes very tedious. And most South Africans don't engage in lawmaking or amending laws. And so this one we need to engage in, because once it becomes law, there's very little you can do. You'll have to go to the Constitutional Court, and that will cost you a lot of money to go to the Con Court, uh, to, to basically fight it off, either on the question of constitutionality. The, look, even if they pass it, even if they, the ANC and 
all these other corrupt parties that vote with them um, <laughs> uh, become railroad this thing, right? And, and, and use majoritarianism. And I have a problem. I'm also an, a proponent against majoritarianism. And I'll explain why. So even if they pass it, you can still go to the court and challenge it on constitutionality. And many organizations are going to do that because it is unconstitutional in and of itself. But this is why it's critical. South Africa has got a proud history. And none of us should ever, ever underestimate how proud our history is globally of fighting against injustice. Mm. South African citizens don't need a political party or anybody to mobilize them. I remember when I was a kid, okay, mostly I was in boarding school or staying at my grands, but on my holidays when I would go home, Elokshini, where my parents stayed, because I stayed in the rural areas, whenever there were boycotts, we were in the forefront as kids throwing stones they used, even used to, I know which accident him would say, may so rest in peace. He's a sort of a, a distant relative of mine. An aunt of mine is married to an uncle of his, so he's not really a relative. But he's from Ewit Bank. And I remember I used to serve on one of his committees when he was a spokesperson in the ANC, in the comms um, committee. And he used to say, whenever I used to make a lot of noise about community media, oh, government is not supporting community media. I'm always an activist. Even <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I keep quiet, stone thrower. <laughs> stone thrower. <laughs> so we are the generation of stone throwers. We must never, ever, ever, as South Africans, wait for permission before we fight an injustice. Mm. We, is we don't this, need is permission. this an injustice? It's an injustice. It's an injustice. One, it's unconstitutional. <clears throat> Two, it's inhumane. anything. This is my body. Mm. This, is, this is fabric. But underneath the fabric, it's my body. Nobody can manufacture my body. Mm. They can clone it, but they can't manufacture it from scratch. And so your natural rights to being human and have your rights to remain a natural person remain yours. If you want to put Botox in your, under your skin or whatever, that's your choice. You have a right to do that also. But you also have a right to remain yourself. You remember there was a time when we couldn't do dreadlocks. I mean, how absurd. How ridiculous does it sound now that mm. there were schools that were actually expelling kids for having dreadlocks? They still mm. have that today. Gain well as alcohol. Still to this day. The school policies that don't allow your natural hair yes right so we need to fight this on the basis of us being human beings and this being an injustice and this being a gross injustice and this being a gross violation of our human uh, human rights and also our citizen rights because there's a difference between our international human rights and our citizen rights but also the mere fact that when we are born we are human beings before we get oppressed and repressed and suppressed by laws that we make as human beings we are born as natural beings. Nobody knows who brought us here. The Christians and others will say it's God, right? And so only God has the ultimate say. And so I get a common to Ozong Jova Minangan. Also, is this law um, enforcing it to go to Zochova Minangan? Yes, with basically what they're doing. They're using all those stupid, uh, what do you call them, those uh, regulations that they used under the Disaster Management Act. So one of the arguments in this act oh, is Also they're using them to be permanent. To now become permanent. <clears throat> and so you need to fight it because like I said, it's going to be difficult to fight it once it becomes permanent. Because it becomes permanent, then we are under control. But it also has extended implications oh. beyond the Health Act. It, it, it has implications to basically every other aspect of our lives. If you allow them to pass this, right, uh, as unconstitutional as it is, you'll basically be saying they can do this with any other sector, any other issue that they want to regulate and, f and, and, and railroad it and slam it down our throats. This is just a test case. You know, capitalism always applies a test case. Before Europeans started basically colonizing violently, they started with slavery. They started with the slave trade. And Masai Sebens are born African men in West Africa selling other African men. Because I African like men are sellouts, right? I like that. So the slave trade would never have succeeded had Africans not sold each other out. And yes. we must stop running away from that. Yes. Black men are the most unreliable revolutionaries. And now when I hear of a black man uh, being a I'm revolutionary, sorry, yeah, I get very worried. I'm happy to talk about at least Steve Bikoabo, Martin Luther King who at least passed on and, you know, sacrificed their lives. Because I'm not sure if Beba Pili and Abu Krisan and Beba Kubega, you know, Beba Zoyenza and maybe Beba Zoyipok and Abu Ngoba, the tradition and the, and, the, and the trajectory of black men in any struggle is always to sell out. Jeez. And so the reality now is that we cannot rely on the men and women, the 400 men and women in parliament. We need to invoke our individual 
rights as individual citizens. So it's very important that every person submits their own rejection. You don't have to write a long semi-thesis like I did. I submitted a five-page. I want you to be true to my reputation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always a problem. Jeez. So everybody must send an email to the Department of Health as an individual. If you don't know what to say, by the way, you can write in your own language. That's nice. Yeah, you can write in any language, Tsonga, whatever you want to write. And state clearly that me personally, I IT number Yami Oganyam Ngaifila for privacy reasons. Yeah. But this is who I am. I reside here. I'm in this municipality. I reject the proposed amendments on this basis for myself. Is it CC? I vote Missy vaccinate. You don't have to explain long stories because the constitution protects your rights to practice your religion yes as you see fit right wow it is five pages yeah <laughs> <laughs> just don't throw us your loop you just don't throw us sure. this mama's don't throw us now boy you don't throw oh, you God. look like a stone throw oh, no, still okay. a stone throw even now that? Bo, yeah you constantly throwing stones <laughs> i'm throwing stones with the mind you, 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 <laughs> you have to i have no choice if you don't throw throw if you don't uh, throw stones because we're in a fully, fully fledged capitalistic environment. People only fight battles that they think they're going to benefit from. Sure. And so, le, people should not wait until it's too late. Mm. They must submit their rejections. And there are also people who, by the way, say, no, 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 that's wrong. Send it to your NGO by submit under the umbrella. But the Department of Health is all Lala Lama games, or as Muslim as I gave the government, which is in Jan. Once they receive an NGO, let's say the Afro Womanist Movement of South Africa submits a general rejection based on what our members have said. But there's at least 300 submissions from our members. They will recognize it as one because it comes through an NGO mm. or whichever entity. Okay, I have a lot of questions to ask, but in Kalan to Kalala, the first thing is to emphasize what Mandis are saying. Imperialism is glorified gangsterism yeah. at the highest level. Thanks, you paraphrased it yeah, nicely. So it's it's the biggest corporations literally fighting for land like any other gang, but at the like highest drug level. Dealers, so yeah. high level gangsterism, gangsterism is called imperialism. Imperialism, yeah. Um, and then I just want to add on to this National Health Act. Um, yeah. Yes, there's petitions you can submit. I think hopefully on this channel we can add some of the links. Yeah, please And then do. to Mandisa's point, I think it's important to number one, if there's links you're getting to submit via petition for whatever, also let's add the email let's address them, yeah. so that the person can email as well. And even if we give them a suggestion of, here's a standard template, I, yeah. whoever, my ID number, yeah. do not want to because it's unconstitutional. Maybe yes, we'll stop. exactly. And then get as many people to submit as possible because the Disaster Management Act is out there to protect us. Yeah. People need to understand that. We're not just yeah. fighting government. Ah, yeah. you. We're saying we understand what the legislation is there for. Yeah. But the problem is you guys now, we've seen what you've done in the past two years. Bullying us, in people the past have 28 been killed. Years. Yeah, okay, <laughs> past 28 years. Past two years with the lockdown, we saw some of the stuff that has been done. Yeah. Forcing people to quarantine. Right now we've got mandatory vaccines, for example. We don't like it. And we're saying, uh, and I, I, I think Kumandisa, when you use the term anti-vaxxer, it's very important for people to understand. It's not saying no one must vaccinate yeah we're saying it's your body it's your do right. what you want if you yeah. want to vaccinate it's fine yeah but don't force other people so yeah. we're just saying we don't want you guys to enforce this thing we're, we're happy with being given choice because we're adults in a democracy yeah. so uh, my two questions the first one um you spoke about something very sensitive in <laughs> going to fight for hip-hop health from your grandfather yeah when i met you i asked if we colored yeah and and i'd seen something on wikipedia and you're like no that's misleading yeah um i'm not colored and you want to explain that yeah then the second question it's not really a question i'd like you to go back to smooth question of the difference between being a womanist and a feminist, and a feminist because okay. you unpacked being an activist yeah thank you firstly colored is a very derogatory term it's just derogatory i i have relatives who are classified as colored who are comfortable to be classified that way and that's fine I respect their right to do that but I always appeal even in community meetings or public meetings or mass meetings I always appeal okay call yourself whatever you want but it's derogatory because really there's no human being who should be called mixed masala you know what stops me from calling a colored person mixed masala because what does colored mean 
it means colored, like as in many colors. I don't know, I just find it derogatory. Now in Agbuza, if we color it, just based on your looks, is that, that's like self discrimination, yeah? I wanna interject, but I'll stop. But, Please carry on. But at the same time, uh, we can't deny our colonial heritage and what it has brought. Like, for instance, in my family, on both sides, Umawam, Uzalwa, Umkosa, Numlung. Kota Numlung has never ever taken responsibility. Your, your mother is first generation yeah. colored. Her yeah. father was white. Yeah. Okay. Even my grandmother, Uzala Ubabwam. But on my grandmother, on my paternal side, it's different because it was pre 1948. Okay. Before it was actually law that people of two race groups could not marry. Before it was criminalized. Ukoko Wami Unonyan was married to an Australian guy. I can't remember his name. Married? Uh, yeah. Come on, Koko. They come could on. get married. Sure. Just society rejected it. Africans re would reject them. As a result, Begat Magazala Bantuana, Abu Koko Wam Nabo, Suspect Nabo, Babatata, Bagamashi, Babatata. You know, because they didn't want her, and also because we were music, na belung, we bang iPhone. That's why I'm an African that were bold enough when they came in in 1948 to say, "Hey, now we're gonna legislate it." The British were comfortable it being just a cultural mm. anomaly, and so you can't deny that. You can't deny that. Si procreatile na belung, ukoko amugwenzile on my mother's side, ukoko amugwenzile on my father's side. Um, we also can't deny that in many cases it was as a result of rape. Yes, many and, cases. And not, it was not consensual. Many cases. But the biggest issue for me is like, go instance kama wamo ba umawa musapi, la belung la ba ba kona la pa e e e shamuari game reserve e e Patterson near Cradock. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. I talk about it openly all the time. Even my sure. mother got annoyed until she realized with I know you Stone thrower, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So me now I'm going to apply, you know, I'm 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 going to pursue a class action lawsuit. And I know after that it's gonna be difficult in the beginning, but others will join, where I'm going to force the family for reparations on many grounds, not just pub health, the dignity issue. Upiga yeah. umtuana. You know, it's just it's inhumane. Yes. You get being un African. La Belung, Basesa Kona, like South Africa. You know, they still live on the land with my family. And Atsuma Wamit Pela Wazana in my mother's family through this. It, there's others as well in her family. And there had to be stories told. You know, we all grew up, you know, if I was Albako, I was Alwa Belung. There always had to be stories. I do Koko because she wasn't, unlike her sister, her sister Vele being at Umlung, no Mumpigi, so she couldn't hide blue eyes and the hair mm. but uko kwa mi wapume like more or less like me but bega shala afari tuk afiki mwen you know there's there's many kids who grew up like that who can tell you horrible stories big no happy sindan that people on social media just vil, at some point vilified him and really you know trashed him how do you trash him to for ukzalwa yes it's not his choice it's just who he is and it's un-african yeah. and it's un-african to yeah. do that you know it's inhuman as well so as the said. dignity of it all mm. and you are brought into the space of indignity by umuntu who didn't want to acknowledge you as in ganeyake but also we have called a monetary value for not being there for this child this child could have had a different kind of life you know, and so Mina, my my conviction is that my mother's father, well, I don't know their surname, Umam they that family, because mm. if Ubabwa Usapila, which is possible because my mom is only 71, so if if Ubabwa Usapila, then it's easy, I go direct to him. If I was appealing, you are, you demand a DNA test, no mawam, because if they share the same bloodline, there'll be a link. Sure. And then I want reparations. And I'm full of over and above the land, because these are the same people who took my family's land. Yo, Mandisa, I'm going to quickly before you continue. So my mother is, uh, her father was Mus uh, Indian, Muslim. Okay. Um, her mother was black, so she's first generation mixed. Yes, as well. And yeah. she's told me very horrific stories about being rejected by certain black people yes, and, and other Indians. people. And I'm just thinking about reparations because yeah. I've tried to reach out to my maternal father's family. He's passed yeah. on. Yeah. And they've been very, very resistant. And I'm wondering if it's not because they think I'm chasing after reparations. You have to chase reparations <laughs> no, 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 anyway. No, no, no. I'm a feeling zwaabo. No, no, I understand. Uh, are neither here nor there. I mean, I just, I just want to get to know my family because... I just want to know. I know. I get that. I also would like that. Yeah. I also would like that. 
um, but I feel more stronger about the fight for justice. I hear you. I also believe that, you know, having been a lawmaker as well at some point in my life, I also believe it's important to set precedents. And often when you do something that's going to set precedents, what happens is, because you're the person of Valente. Yes. The, the people who start a struggle are always the first casualties. Yes. And of course, I mean, because of how long it's going to take, they're going to resist. I mean, you've got the constitution. They don't need to be nice to you. You don't need them to be your friends. If they're already hostile, it's easy. It actually makes it easier because mm -hmm. you're already expecting the hostility. Mm -hmm. You go there rosy-eyed thinking, oh, they're going to, you know, welcome me with open arms. There are people today who are married, you know, across race, um, you know, Indian and African, African and white, you know, even Amakala and African, who really still, you know, get abused, yeah. you know, by their in-laws, you know, and get called, I get called names. I, I, I was asked in an interview by a reporter live, Uguti, did I not benefit from colorism? Mm. I was like, you know, if I can start telling this person the horrific stories that my mother and my father mm. experienced, Sikula in the 70s and the 80s, when we would travel from, you know, the Transvaal to the Eastern Cape, you know, and you pay and pay and pay until you just feel like, you know what, Enough. So <laughs> it was an annual thing. And the horrific experiences we would have, because my mother looks like she could be white, right? But she's an African person. She doesn't relate to herself as a white person. But when people look at her, because South Africans are racist. We are racist as Africans. No, as well. we're not. It's not possible for a black person no, to no, be no, racist. No, 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 no. No, I experience Angumawam. So what must I say? Because I've experienced it. My when, own when, we, as well. when we stop in my shops, there was that nonsense. You go to my mom could go into the shop based on looks. And now at that point, we know my mom is fluently. Africans, you are now worse. Mm. But because of her looks, I like, guess you were classified just by your looks. They didn't care what language yeah. you spoke. She could go into the shop. I couldn't go into the no, shop. No. Yeah, I was actually much, much darker when you were as a younger, kid. No? Yeah. Okay. Also because I grew up in the rural areas and yeah, I was bundi bashing. So, I mean, always had to go to the window. And then my mother with my older sister could <laughs> Thank go. Thank you, old lady. <laughs> we could go into the, Look, I didn't understand, so it didn't really hurt me, but my parents did explain it to us. And then we would encounter a lot of racial mm. attacks. My mom was racially attacked by African people as well. Yes. So maybe we can't be racist towards whites, I agree. But we can be racist towards ourselves. I think I experienced it. I was asked by a journalist, did I not benefit from colorism? Mm. And I was like, okay, so what should I do? The difference between a, a feminist and a womanist. Yeah. Basically, a feminist, I'll simplify it. I'm going to oversimplify it. I prefer to oversimplify things. I'm intellectual, I'm a university lecturers, I'm a PhDs will come and <laughs> embellish it, right? But the simplistic way of looking at it is, a white woman who fights women's struggles can be classified a feminist. Okay. And then a black woman who fights women's struggles, whether they're economic, social, it doesn't matter, mm. can be classified as a womanist. Because Abafaz Babelung, okay, even a, a man for that matter, because remember you can be a womanist as a man, you can be a feminist a as womanist. a womanist? Yeah. As a man? Yeah. Okay, okay. I know about feminism. Yeah, yeah, you can also be a womanist. Sure. If you side with me as an African woman and you and you and you show allegiance to my struggles, then of course you're a woman. Even as a man. Yes, sure. for the same reason. If you fight women's struggles genuinely, not because of funu gyo funi mali somewhere as as it often happens. Oh, I know that. I know those. Stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, European women, white women, cannot be womanist because they were not colonized. They don't have that added burden mm. that black women have so I could fight alongside a white woman for women's struggles okay. up to a certain point it gets to a point where a white woman's struggles are not as deep as mine as they fight against colonialism with African men alongside African men mm. against everything that is represented by the colonial domination um, epoch and then a white woman at some point can't 
because there are certain benefits and certain obvious privileges of also just being white sure. that she has. But then she also suffers as a woman, right? Because obviously we all know the most sexist, misogynistic human beings on earth are white men. They are the ones who imported misogyny and sexism to Africa because we essentially existed right up until white men arrived in the 1400s in North Africa. We existed on a matriarchal plane. And people always argue with me about it and it's a simple thing. In Africa, you could not own land as a man. You could not hold land title because we understand intrinsically and we're living the results of the bad decisions we've taken now. And you give him power over umhlaba. In Ghana is your you are homeless very soon because and so when you give a woman land you're almost guaranteed except for those few dysfunctional women about corner corner but there's always a minority that will let you down we're not perfect dang it yes but the, an overwhelming majority of women will take care of everybody mm. even begrudgingly unless there's a very serious reason like for safety you know you're becoming a danger to other people but I'm a daughter say as when Zagalan never now listen to Zen is a fun about Faza Banini Yabon Zokri Evangeli Mikoto is sometimes so the the land security and land tenure issues become more at risk when you give men right to title so we are a matriarchal uh, people, people in Africa that's our, our, our genealogy, really. You know, mm. obviously our character has changed and evolved in our personalities, but our genealogy. And with the introduction of colonialism, and of course colonialism was a precursor to capitalism, yeah? So capitalism couldn't happen without land, and also, by the way, capitalism couldn't happen without the health sector. So the healthcare sector was the first sector to introduce capitalism. And so womanists, womanists are African women or black women, whether they are in America or here, or whatever, because we have an extra battle to fight against black men but can i ask it's it sounds to me listening to you like feminism is the base yeah a woman fighting against women issues yes is feminism is, uh, we're all feminists and then on top of feminism is womanism, is womanism if you're an african woman and you suffered the colonial so onslaught. you can be a feminist and a womanist of but course you, but if you're a white woman you can't be a womanist you can mm, only be a feminist you can if you want i mean there are white people i mean it's racist to assume that white people don't genuinely fight black struggles. It's really racist. I mean, we all have white friends that are very genuine and very committed and have done and proven themselves over and over again. I also find it abusive. We need to evolve. We need to be progressive people. We can't continuously complain about white people when our own weaknesses overpower us. Look, mm. I mean, here in South Africa, there's been a black government for 28 years. We've regressed in terms of every scale of development. Mm. We have regressed much further or farther than the, the white government. That was openly brutal and openly racist right mm -hmm. so it's, it's like you know if i have to do business with a racist i actually don't care i really don't care if a person is racist i understand what i'm doing in that business deal yes. i am going to get what i need to get you can be racist for me that's your own private issue but it becomes deeper when an african betrays another african like in the slave trade like it happens now with bee deals bee mm -hmm. deals um again in the a white woman can you are asking that question can be a womanist if she truly or he even a white man truly identifies with our struggles and in a very genuine way without being patronizing and trying to infiltrate just to turn it around. I mean, if you look at the BE space, I was about to make that example. If you look at the BE space, it's the biggest, next biggest sellout um, phenomenon mm. that we've experienced as, as, as black women in this continent after the slave trade. Mm -hmm. You're on an labor broking because BEE beneficiaries, as few as they already are in relation to the broader population of, of the African population in South Africa, African native mm. uh, population, because you can be African and not native to South Africa. Yes. Um, but the, the point I'm, 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 I'm going to is that if you look at BEE and its beneficiaries, the, I don't know, maybe by maybe 5,000, I don't know, or 10,000, <laughs> doesn't matter in relation to 50 million of us. Mm. Secondly, there's no beneficiation. Mm. There's no trickle-down effect yes. or trickle-up effect of BEE amongst black people. Those people are men, are black men. Very, very few beneficiaries of BEE 
genuine beneficiaries of EE who are black women. I've got one more question before I hand back to Sbuda. Uh, one of the things I have heard about BEE is I, I stand to be corrected, but it's, I think it's created 480 billion rand in value and over 80% of it has ended up in white hands. Back in again. white hands, of course. Um, my, my last question is, do you think in the struggle for land, part of the struggle needs to be saying, let's give all the land to women? Yeah. And men, men should just understand that Nizorenta. to work the land on, on behalf Nizorenta. of our women and our children. It, we must still be logical. We must still be logical. We're now in a different society. We're no longer using cattle to basically plow. So we have the technology we have. We have some of the advancements we have. We use English as our main language right now. There's nothing wrong with that. Society is like that. Society will develop. Don't be hardcore about struggles. Don't be so <laughs> hardcore that you become an, an, an idiot. You're like, I am so fully computer because I'm an African. Yeah, yeah. That's stupid. Nizorenta um, Giti will do business with each other. But I have a really deep passion that men should not be allowed to hold title, whether they are white men or black men, because the scourge of abuse of women is precisely derived from the fact that we are so dispossessed. Yeah. Uh, African women are dispossessed in South Africa on every score. We earn the lowest salaries. The average salary of a black woman in South Africa is 3,500 in a month. Uh, I had this debate with a guy who says claims to be a pharmacist and I had to ask myself about his father. He's like, no, but I work with women who earn more money than me. Oh, like, that's Come on. so lame. I'm talking median, average, yeah. right? Um, the average black woman, African woman, black woman, actually, I'm a Kalatinati. I'm a Dia, it's probably a different story because the Indian, if you look at unemployment amongst the Indian population, I think it's under 6%. If you look at unemployment amongst the white population in South Africa, it's under 3%. And then you look at the unemployment, uh, you know, amongst colored people and black and African people, uh, natives, um, it's massive. It's like over 60% now. But if you look at that unemployment figure of that, within that 60%, maybe 80% are women of the unemployed. So we are economically repressed, oppressed and oppressed deliberately. We are politically repressed, oppressed and suppressed deliberately. We are culturally oppressed, suppressed, and repressed deliberately. We have massive cultural chauvinism. There's a young girl in Venda who's supposed to be the head of the monarchy there. Mm. And the current toxic misogynists, I think it's the VBS thug. You? The guy who stole money from VBS is a, supposedly a regent of the Venda people, right? Is refusing to relinquish the throne to this, um, she was still young uh, when her, I don't know if it was a mother or father who was the head of the monarchy then. Mm. And because mm. she was young, obviously they had to find a regent with Bambambeli's kundla until she's old enough. Then they started some toxic sexist to go So cultural chauvinism in South Africa, amongst us as black women, I see a girl always criticize Abelung because shame, Abelung on the developmental scale, they are much more advanced than us. And Tina, we are so stupid. Instead of developing each other and ourselves in a coordinated, organized, sophisticated, intellectually sound way and economically sound way, we fight over stupid things. Because we ask, Mm-hmm. Especially if you got a senior position. Because you applied before you get a opinion. You applied for the job, you didn't get it. And then others ask you, yeah, you benefited from cal- you know, colorism. Oh, no, no, because you know. Pretty privilege. So now, I can't be light-skinned, I can't be female, I can't be cute. Everyone must be the chosen black. Everyone you wants know? to be the chosen black. You know, so... Why yeah. did you leave the EFF? Oh, I hear you. I don't to EFF. I don't know if I'm going to EFF But at the time, you know, I'm groomed in the sort of corporate culture. 
So, you know, I entered politics with my corporate mentality. Professional. I, I would often be called elitist. <laughs> I would often be called elitist. <laughs> you shame. Know. Shame. Hey, I'm short. 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 I'm 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 short. 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 I'm I'm short. I'm short. I'm because when I first resigned in 2016, I was diplomatic about it. It was a private conversation between me, the national chair, and the president. At the time, I had been, if my last corporate position was with Vodacom Business, and I was talking with my ex bosses to say, guys, Anaka, they're not, come back anytime. So I was like, okay, guys, I can still go back to Vodacom Business. Uh, can I, can we give each other six months? You know, I was being corporate about it. Because <laughs> I thought, I'm senior, I'm running the province, so I need to hand over. I was yes. like, hey, who's politics? I can't hand over. Back mm, to you're like, no, it's just six months to hand over. And see, they do this. What? Back to Wula. I'm going to hand over. Back to Wula. Back to Wula. Serious? Oh, I would do it. I can, I can tell personal the latest stories video? about that. I this saw is the, the latest, latest video. video. 2016 stats of the political, the, it's not political violence, it's violence and murder, of people killing each other over council positions in the ANC were 500. Sure. 2016. 500. I mean, personally, I know even last year, I need to add local elections. Yeah. So, mind you, people have got terms. Yeah. Five, three year, five year five contract. Years, yeah. As soon as elections were done, I you have to work out your. Puma, yes. You're like, no, but you hey. Because it's not about the people. Yeah, they take you out. That's a fact. It's documented, it's there. People get killed. No, go and check the stats of 2016. 2016. What they call political killings, and it's not. It can be called a political killing. A murder is a murder. Um, I generally don't like to talk about people I worked with, because I think that it benefits nothing. It benefits no one anything except for audience ratings and all of that. And of course, it just Twitter noise. I even left Twitter because I, I just can't engage in a certain level of noise. People should say whatever they want to say. I don't have a problem. It's I'm a Democrat through and through. Uh, I believe in free speech. <laughs> Um, except for when you are now, you know, trampling on my yeah. rights and I have a right to then go and sue you, you know, or, or you're just being toxic and ugly, you know. But um, the, the current form of politics, one of the other struggles I'm pursuing now is electoral reforms. <laughs> I've got a lot of stuff that I'm busy with, <laughs> electoral reforms. And that's why it was important for me to get out of a uh, formal political party, especially leadership. I, I'm still a member of a political party I'm not going to mention because I'm a political animal, it's my right, and I can You're not going to mention? No, I'm not going to mention it. But you're a member of a political <laughs> yes, party? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, I also helped that political party strategically in terms of uh, establishing policy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but because I believe I have to affiliate, right? But what I do not believe in is the, the governance system the electoral system so i participated i participate with the new nation movement it's a civic uh, movement that basically is fighting for electoral uh, reforms in south africa uh, and we won a case or the new nation movement won the case in the constitutional court uh, in june 2020 uh, that uh, individuals must be able to contest political office because it's unconstitutional mm. for the electoral act to say that um, an, an individual cannot stand for president or premier or mayor mm. because currently individuals can only stand at local government elections as a ward councillor candidate. But at uh, mayoral level and uh, let's say premier for prov province, I don't even believe provinces should exist. South Africa is a very small country. We should just abolish the provinces. They're just an extension of corruption and all of that uh, and duplication and just all sorts of nonsense. Mm. Um, but. Um, I, I do not believe, and the Constitutional Court agreed, and the, they granted us the judgment. Now it's on the shoulders of the Home Affairs Committee in the National Assembly in Parliament, and also the Office of the Speaker, and also the IEC and all related uh, statutory bodies under Home Affairs to basically now implement the judgment. So basically what the judgment is saying is that you should stand for public office as an individual 
whether or not you belong to a political party. So he can stand for public mm. office because already he has the profile and it would be easy and he's an honorable guy. You too, of course, by the way. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and by the way, looks also count, eh? How? So <laughs> Jeez. Oh, is that for I me? Yeah, that's for you. That's for you. I need to you always insult us. I don't have brains. Why am I so catching now and straight then, bullets? No. No, not what you. Speak about men. You oh, is plural. I don't know why I'm catching straight bullets here. You oh, is plural. Your police have you got a plural. different sexual organ. I, we should have been in case and in city use. <laughs> then you understand that I mean you in plural. Yeah. yeah, but the bottom line is that it's unconstitutional to have uh, only political parties contest public office, especially at a senior level. But also on a secondary level, we have a political system, a democratic constitutional uh, political system in South Africa we use called proportional representation. Proportional representation, you can go and do your research. Um, in all the countries around the world where proportional representation is used as a sole, or, or let me put it, dominant system, yeah? Mm. Because, like I said, we do have at what level? It's can, very complicated. At what level you can contest? I'm going to simplify it for you. At what mm. level you can contest as an independent? As sure. an individual. Currently. Right? It's always been like that. It was amended, I think, 1996. Okay. I, I stand corrected. Okay. So that's fine. But you can't have a mayor stand, say, I want, I'm the mayoral candidate, you know, I'm own. coming with my own resources. Yes, I might be affiliated to a political party, but I'm standing as an individual. I'll tell you why it's critical. Proportional representation is the reason majority, um, in fact, all countries that are governed through the proportional representation, democratic, it might be democratic, but it's proportional representation, mm. are all failed states. So South Africa was, we were doomed to fail from 1999 onwards when uh, we did not follow the, uh, what was the report? You remember there was an interim constitution? No. Be <laughs> Maybe you are not old enough. But there was an interim constitution. I'm being ageist. <laughs> there was an interim constitution between 1994 and 1996. That's why your constitution now is called the Constitution of South Africa of 1996. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there okay. was an interim constitution based on the Codesa negotiations. Codesa Tem temporary Codesa constitution before yeah. they finalized. Okay. Because obviously there's a lot of uh, bureaucracy in the process. Then the constitution became final. The interim constitution stated very clearly. And Nelson Mandela, former president Nelson Mandela, by the way, whom I love, even though I criticize him. Mm. I love him. It, I criticize my dad, but yes. I love my dad. Yes. Um, the interim constitution and Nelson Mandela, when he exited office, when he resigned, reminded everybody that the interim constitution says this is an interim constitution, one. Two, this interim constitution supports the Electoral Act in its current form because they needed to push the elections of 94. Mm. So there had to be an act to push those elections. Uh, otherwise, the elections would have been illegal okay. and unconstitutional. Uh, the interim constitution needs to make sure it has, had, a, had a, a clause that stated that the Electoral Act, as one of the acts of the governing South Africa, must be amended in 1999 by the end of the first term of the democratic government to accommodate South Africa and fully accommodate the spirit of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution and allow individuals mm. to contest beyond political parties. Mm. Because Nelson Mandela knew what crisis this was going to bring about. Basically what proportional representation brings about is all the problems you see now, where there's bullying in political parties, there's ganging up in political parties, there's um, uh, crass factionalism in, co in political parties. Factionalism, by the way, is not a wrong thing. It's just we all misunderstand it. Factionalism means me and you differ ideologically. Mm. It's you not meant to be a bad term. Is what it's saying. not a bad term. It's okay. Actually, if, if me... if, if if I have a faction against you mm. and I manage to co persuade my faction to say, you want, give us a stupid example, let's say you believe that land should never be uh, repatriated back to Africans. And I say land must be repatriated back to Africans. Yes. That is, that a is, disagreement a, that is, a, that is, a, that is a, a legitimate grounds to have a factional disagreement. Okay. It's on a policy and an ideological level. Not laying We've dirtied the word. It's not meant to be a bad word. That's the truth. Okay. Yeah. So when 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 uh, Robert Sabuka left the ANC, he he had a faction that left the ANC. That was a faction mm. because it was on the basis that they didn't believe in multiracialism. They believed 
even non-racialism, they had a problem with it. They yes. also had a problem with some of the land propositions that they in. They had a very solid land ideological. That's when you differ on an ideological level or a policy level and you can substantiate it. Yes. Rationally, not Mumpeto. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> basically I was still trying to explain that Nelson Mandela, when he said goodbye to all of us, mm -hmm. in his speech, go and Google it, he spoke about this and said, no, the Electoral Act must be amended. It wasn't amended. That's why the New Nation Movement was never going to lose that case in the Constitutional Court. They lost it in the Western Cape High Court mm. um, and then escalated to the Constitutional Court and the Constitutional Court made the finding. It's extremely important that you are able to hold anyone accountable, including your own father and your own mother. Yes, I agree. Right? Why should you not hold people accountable who are presiding in Parliament, in legislature and in council? over money that you gave them. They can't just do as they wish with your money. Your tax money is your tax money. Like South Korea are exercising very effective civilian oversight. Where you don't just rely on me holding a seat in parliament to come and give you a report back as a community say, hey, le a budget, a manzi, I made sure I fought for it. Hey, beba no, what if I'm lying and I'm colluding? behind the scenes, which is what is happening anyway in Parliament. Uh, various individuals from different political parties called So they've even taken the business of government and they've made it a family business or factional business and all of that. And where individuals, entrepreneurs in South Africa, find it very difficult to get government business. Because it's already been agreed before a tender comes out with affection gaban is a tender specifically uban. Does that happen in Parliament? Of behind course. the scenes? Of course. Listen, CEOs, government CEOs, the most dangerous position in South Africa to hold is the position of a director general, head of department, CEO of a parastatal. When you hold those positions, by CEO post office. If you don't agree, you can't get the job. And if you get the job and you want to be an activist and you fight, you're out. So most of these CEOs and MEs and uh, HODs and Directors General and di uh, Deputy Directors General, um, even uh, Chief Director, not so much, but all the very top decision-making guys, they are there because private school fees because Abana choice, Nalama Golf Estates, Abawa Tandai, because Bazo team. No, 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 that I, was, I was basically just saying that you can't have proper civilian oversight over government budgets. You can't have proper direct accountability because when you go through proportional representation, you, you report through your political party. And then my follow-up question to what do you think of the politics of the different political, yeah. po political parties that I've mentioned? Now I'm going to zoom in or let me say, let me, let me magnify the ANC now. Yeah. What do you think of um, the current... Um, or, or let me say, ever since the current president, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa, has been president, what do you think of what has happened to the um, parastatals of the country over the past couple of years? So I, I've worked for a couple of parastatals as well, um, and the massive ones. It's not possible to collapse a parastatal in three years. Prior to that, he was deputy president. Mm. In the context of accountability, he has to take responsibility. Every head of department must take responsibility. Political heads like presidents, premiers must take, even the Public Finance Management Act and the Municipal Finance Management Act states that, that you take personal accountability um, as an accounting officer. So yes, the president holds personal responsibility according to the law, according to the PFMA, for all the problems and all the wrongdoings and all the, the, the thieving, really. But we have to be honest. Uh, for instance, I worked for South African Airways. I also worked for Transnet briefly at some point. Um, and a lot of the rot started because the government, national government, let's look at the national parastatals. Oh, the provincial ones are worse. In Gauteng, there's a, there's a horrible um, uh, agency called Gauteng Enterprise Propeller. Your it's, GP. Yeah, I, I got death threats in Alexandra. And I was sued, I was attempted to be sued by Paul Mashatile and, and Lebukhang Maile because I call them corrupt because they are corrupt. And they get the clip. And they can gladly take me back to court and they can gladly go and mobilize their Alex people to threaten to shoot me again. Um, in fact, they said I sh I'm not allowed in Alexandra. Houteng Enterprise Propeller. Why would they say you're not allowed in Alexandra? Sorry. 
because I called them corrupt after some oh. rally we had. Yeah. Oh, okay. and and they they they, they've been terms that I've heard. They were called the Alex Mafia. They called the Alex Mafia. They never sued. They never sued. They never sued. But that's what's said out there. They never sued any of the white people who called them Alex Mafia, the misogyny of the world. So the minute a black woman called them corrupt, banki bed. But, why, but why, why would you call them corrupt? Because <laughs> they are. I mean, all the entities they presided <clears throat> over. I mean, uh, Paul, during his time, at some point, he was MEC of whatever, and he was, I think, not Premier, but he was chairperson of the province politically, but he was an MEC. There was a massive corruption in relation to specifically the Alexander Renewal Project, the um, uh, 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 Winter, is it Winterfeld? Not Winterfeld. I think it's Winterfeld, um, Everton. There was an Everton renewal project, Alexander renewal project, one in Pretoria, I think it was Winterfeld, and then the Bekestal renewal project, where basically billions were siphoned. And he was supposed to account for it. And You're so, speaking about the GEP? No, I'm speaking, he was asking sure. about Paul. Sure. Um, and I personally don't have respect for anyone who chairs a political party at a provincial level or national level and there's a lot of corruption and that person doesn't account. So I would hold you personally <laughs> responsible for such corruption if okay. you were an MEC and you did nothing about it. Imali to pay that money that disappeared. Um, with his um, uh, friend, young friend, uh, at some point he was MEC for Economic Development where GEP, I was serving uh, on uh, SCOPA. And I can tell you that there were monies that disappeared from Gauteng Enterprise Propeller. So I held him personally responsible because the PFMA says he's personally responsible as an MEC. And monies disappeared from the Gauteng Enterprise Propeller. And uh, we, when we asked for them to account to us, they told us that most of those companies they can't find anymore. How? They disappeared. I mean, where have you heard such nonsense? And one of the things I said to them was, but you're government. How can someone run away from government? You mm. issue driver's licenses. You issue permits for people to build. You can't do anything without government. You issue mm. passports. ID, you issue bank ID, account, you issue residential. Birth certificates. You issue uh, metric certificates. You issue, most of the universities are public. They issue university. Government is responsible for laws. Mm. So if I get a government project or government money, by the time government gives me that money, government has verified me. Mm. disappear from government. <laughs> like, it's the most ridiculous thing. A private company has to get private investigators. But I want to come back to your question you were asking about the different political parties and specifically about Cyril Ramaphosa. So in the context that he's head of state, yes, he's personally liable. He knows it. The PFMA says so. So is Jacob Zuma. So is Khalima Mutlante. So is Tabo Mbegi. So is uh, uh, President Nelson Mandela, so is De Klerk, and so is every other state president, Malan, Boeta, uh, Jan Smats, Fervut, all of them. Why I, why I mentioned... Pause, pause, Fervut. Yeah, 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 Fervut. Yeah, Fervut was a psychologist or psychiatrist pause. or something. So I mentioned them because there's something that South Africans don't understand, especially those in politics. When they negotiated the Codesa negotiations, they agreed that they would accept the, the, the previous governments, that government is continuing. You mm -hmm. didn't stop government. That is why you continued with the same framework of financial governance and other forms of governance, even the demarcation, even the demarcation of municipalities, etc. Of course, they did change some demarcation because they needed to collapse the Bantu stands. But you, you basically took over the infrastructure of the white uh, apartheid government, mm. as it were. And of course, 28 years down the line, you've proven to ourselves that a black government is unable to introduce a better system of governance. Yeah, but. We all know that the collapse of all the state entities started as soon as the ANC took over. Basically, let me put it that way. It just got worse over time. And I think during Nelson Mandela's era and Thabo Mbeki's era, it was much better in the, in, in the sense that uh, a lot of the parastatals could generate their own income because they are a company like any other company. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that they are owned by government. Uh, and so they do need to generate their own revenues. They do need to post profits, and then the profit goes to the shareholder. Like, for instance, the Airports Company of South Africa, for the longest time, I haven't checked stats now, I haven't checked my annual reports, but the Airports Company was this one of the most profitable, along with the National Ports Authority, mm -hmm. was the most profitable entities in government, where they annually they posted net profits to the tune of billions, mm -hmm. and they, those would be paid to the, to the Department of Transport as the shareholder. And so... During Thabo Mbeki's time and, of course, uh, former President Nelson Mandela's time, the, the management was much better. 
governance frameworks were much better. You could apply for a job at any of the parastatals genuinely, like without talking to anybody and be shortlisted and actually get a job. Mm. I got a job at SA, I applied. I submitted my CV, I was superior, got the job, same. I saw an advert in the Sunday Times and I wanted to move to Durban. I applied for the ports, corporate affairs manager, ports of Durban, the largest port in sub-Saharan Africa. I was a superior candidate, I got the job. Mm. I never spoke to anybody, there was no corruption, none of them knew me. You know, I was just another, you know, black, whatever, you know. Mm. And so, yes, I was female and so, but the, the law says females must be prioritized if they are competitive. Sure. So the wheels fell off when Jacob Zuma took over government and nobody must lie about that. And Jacob Zuma took over government as president and the wheels fell off governance and financial governance completely. We should never be dishonest about the reality. Amilka Cabral said it. When you are at war mm. and you deny the truth about your enemy's strengths, basically you deny the strengths of your enemy, you're a fool. You're a fool. Even if someone is your enemy, mm. when they have a strength, you must acknowledge the strength. Mm. Because that's how we develop. That's how ICT develops. That's how all technologies and innovations develop. I innovate this, you come and you improve from this. Sure. You can't start this from scratch. There's an IP here, you work from this IP mm. and you improve it, right? So Jacob Zuma got an IP and he trashed it. And it's not personal. Yeah, I don't particularly like the guy. I do find him funny. I like him because he's funny. <laughs> I mean, I think the last time I laughed when the president spoke was when he was president. Mm. But you know, it's a tragic laughter because he's collapsed the country. Cyril Ramaphosa, having taken over, understanding how terrible the depth he was deputy president by the way he was head of government he should have stood up to the president in that portfolio of being head of government but understanding how the ANC operates lend to a proportional representation Uguchi, if you don't do as we say mm. we'll pull you out so it engenders corruption in proportional representation lend to being issued I'm a director's general so what are you gonna do you'll end up cooperating but now that he's head of uh, the state, he really, really should have pushed much harder to clean out government in terms of governance frameworks, in terms of ensuring that there's no deployment to SOEs, there's no deployment to critical positions like a director general, there's no deployment to positions that require technical expertise. If you need an actuary, you need an actuary. You can't be an actuary if mm. you're not an actuary. If you need an engineer, look, look, at, look at the case that in crisis. And really, my heart goes out even to the business people, again, who have lost businesses after that reckless looting by Jacob Zuma's RET forces. They are the ones who did it. We know it. I was the first person to define that thing as an, a failed, attempted coup d'etat. It was not Cyril. Cyril took it from me from a Power FM interview I did. The reason the, the, the damage of the rain has caused more damage than it has is because the municipality is no longer applying strict engineering standards, even for private buildings. Mm. If I want to build a hotel, I know that this geography or this topography doesn't allow this size building, this angle, whatever. But you can see it when the buildings collapse, that underneath there's just sand. Mm. Who approved that building? It's got nothing to do with whether it's a private or government building. Municipality is charged with that. And therefore, they should actually be taken to court. They should actually be sued by the citizens of, of KZN. The citizens of, of KZN, all affected citizens, especially the ones who lost children and loved ones and lost businesses and income, uh, should actually sue the state to say, we can actually hold you personally liable because, uh, you know, there are geologists, there's all sorts of engineers. They can prove that that amount of rain, okay, how come the apartheid houses haven't been demolished? that are much older than mm. those 2,000 houses built in the 1950s. How come they aren't demolished by the rain? They got the same rain because underneath the structure was done professionally. Mandi Sankala, I'm trying to Jacob Zoom. I don't want to defend him. Yeah. I want to ask, since you mentioned Uta to Nelson Mandela and Thabo Mbegi, is there a chance that, because you say it's taken time, Yeah. There were still white people running some of those parastatals. And then Uzuma came and brought in black people. And maybe Cyril, I mean, we see it to Andre the Reiter at this point. bringing back the, the, bringing back the white people. Is, is the issue maybe that Uzuma brought in blacks? And the issue is 
I don't. It's just a question from me. It's the the, the issue is that uh, under Zuma's administration, they replaced a lot of skills, whether black or white. Okay, so it's, yeah. it's, it's not a race thing. No, it's not a race thing. It will look like a race thing because, of course, during apartheid, majority of the people who were running, and and it's wrong, you know. I mean, I got my first job with FNB during during apartheid, mm. along with many other young black people, right? Um, during apartheid, there was a much higher rate of employment in the private sector. My sure. father, we had medical aid when I grew up. Because my dad worked for a British company called Babcock that built all the power stations in SEDEC, across Africa, and wherever else, right? Mm. We had medical aid. Lots of black children can tell you they grew up with medical aid during apartheid. Because medical aid, the law was progressive. It forced companies to cushion workers. The provident funds and the pension funds were much better structured. Pension funds now are badly structured. You're better off saving your own money privately. So it's the crass... Uh, it's, it's this inability of black people to recognize standards and quality and constantly label people who want to do things on a qualitative level. There's Wu, he's got a product that mm. I can buy inside any retail outlet. I can go into any hotel, any retail outlet, mm. any mall and find it because it complies with the standards it needs to comply with and probably even supersedes that. We fail to do that. And uh, every Marty, time, we, you're saying black people. Black people. Okay. We, we often fail to do what Spoo is doing and other black people who do apply quality standards in their businesses and their innovations. There are many. I mean, there's a please call me guy. There's many examples. Mm. Um, <coughs> and as a result, we get run by what we normally used to refer to in politics as lumpens. So it's the fact that they replace professionals mm. with, I don't know, who they replace them with. It's the fact that they started applying nepotism Yes. It's the fact that they started corrupting every little thing. Like Jacob Zuma even, I remember the one time Jacob Zuma made such a crass joke and people laughed. It's really not funny. And he said, yeah, women in South Africa today, especially black women, uh, they no longer know the difference between sexual harassment and, and, and ukshe. Ukshela. What an insult to all of us who have been molested and raped. Are you telling me like we are Shela, like we are Shela, Angbon, we are Shela, and if it's sexual harassment, I can't. It's an insult even to us. It's an insult even to the rape victims. Mm. And everybody laughed, like we laughed at Jacob Zuma's jokes, and unfortunately, we laugh at other politicians who crack stupid jokes, but we don't realize we labant laba mat dictators in the making, abo Idi Amin in the making, bakala velengo kuklegi sa Idi Amin was very funny, very very funny guy. There's a lot of clips, Zaki, that you can watch and actually laugh. But the end result of his actions. So U Jacob Zuma got into government along Nama Brigade Waake. I mean, you could even tell just from the quality of ministers that were there. Mm. There's even a fashion now, Yogutabantu, Mabagu government, and they're in political positions by degrees. They pretend to enroll, Bapalelwe my exams, my assignments, and all of that. And so it's a question for us and posterity, for our generation, we're going to have to carry this country going forward. What do we want for South Africa? What do we want? I don't want a South Africa that um, destroys business. I don't care if it's owned by a white person or whatever. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight for reparations for my mother, but I, I don't want any white person killed in the process. Mm. I need them to understand that there was an injustice, and I want to correct that injustice. It's my right. I love South Africa with other race groups, by the way, because I just think if we're left alone as black people, wow. You don't believe blacks can do things on their own? We are a failed state. With black leadership. Partly because we have proportional representation. Not black leadership, corrupt black leadership. Black, uh, corrupt black leadership that does not appreciate quality and qualification. Uh, we, we, we need to understand that we are living in an environment and a world that cannot and you know, our population today is not the same population as in 1652 when white people came here. Mm. 1652, I think we were like three million. <laughs> so you can you you have to be intelligent about, you know, your your your, your radicalism. You can't can't be reckless. Mm. You know, you can't say I'm I'm radical. Radical just simply means I'm proposing something completely different. A, a, a smartphone was radical when TVs were this big. Mm. You know, when nanotechnology was radical when there was no nanotechnology. So that's radicalism. When you're proposing something that's way starkly different to what you have now, we, we have to stop being reckless as black people. 
We have to stop also the, the nepotistic behavior. If I start a business, I can't employ my sister because she's my sister. Yes, I can employ her if she has the skills required and the temperament and the character I require for that particular responsibility that I have in my business. Also, it's your business. You're investing in it. Why would you want to hire somebody who doesn't know what they're doing? Mm -hmm. You're throwing your money down. It's a sure guaranteed, um, you know, sure guaranteed uh, recipe for disaster that your business is going to collapse. If you need an engineer, get an engineer. If the engineer needs to be a hydrologist, he needs to be a hydrologist. If he needs to be an architect, he needs to be an architect with experience. You know, we saw there was one uh, department, it was communications department, where a very young daughter of Jacob Zuma's was employed because she has a master's degree in communications, a very senior position in government, mm. DDG or something. I was shocked. I was like, I come from the communications space. I'm mm. like, wow. She oh. just came out of varsity. That is so dangerous. And so, women is fund and you go to Missimali. You can't do that. You have to, you have to pursue the end goal. Like you have to want to help. You have to resolve a problem with your entrepreneurial solution. I want to add on to Sbu's question. Um, I think what I'm taking from you is that Abantaba Mnyama in particular must stop looking for shortcuts. I know we're speaking about it from a government perspective, but I think even in our own personal okay. lives, uh, you need to respect the process, uh, okay. for example. But I want to add on to Usbu's question. Number one, do you think Usiril Ramaphosa is a good president for this country? Um, number two, moving forward after Cyril, whether this term or if he has a second term, do you see a future for, for leadership in government? I just don't believe that the ANC is capable of giving us a good president anymore. I don't want to be unfair to Cyril, you know what I mean? Because he did take over a poisoned chalice. But again, he's partly responsible for it because he was deputy president. Like I said, he had powers. A deputy president in South Africa is responsible for government business, so all the sort of corporate aspects of government. And so, but because of proportional representation, he was scared of being removed. He couldn't take certain stances. He said that himself, which is nonsense. Mm -hmm. There's never ever a time when you're holding public office, when the interests of citizens must supersede the interest of your political party. Like for instance, they always talk about renewing this party, renewing our party, making our party better. Why do you want to make your party better? Your party exists to contest elections. And when you contest elections, you get into government, you are there to manage government affairs for the benefit of citizens, not for the benefit of your political party members. So I don't think Cyril, even if he tried under proportional representation, he could ever be a good president. I don't think any president under the ANC um, and, and some of the others as well that are aspirant <laughs> that want to run the country could be good because they are, they, are, they are way too corrupt. Mm. Their corruption, look, I mean, we've normalized corruption. In, there are countries where if you steal a thousand dollars from the state, you're going to go to jail for 20 years. Or you get in killed. South Africa, you steal a billion, or you go, there's a death penalty. Is yeah. it China? China. Yeah. And, and somewhere in the middle, um, what do you call it, uh, Southeast Asian countries? Sure. South Africa, you steal a million, you steal a billion. <laughs> Two billion rand literally disappeared from the bank account of the state intelligence agencies during Jacob Zuma's time. And I heard rumors that that's the money that was used to pay people about 20,000 rand to fill a bus to loot people's businesses in, in Durban. And so Cyril can't be a good president because he comes from a rotten, rotten... Um, you know, uh, political party that has institutionalized. Mm. Listen, they have a format of how to loot in the ANC. Sure. Like it's a format, they stick to it. They actually don't understand when you don't want corruption. It's like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Mina was told by <coughs> somebody in that organization I left. And this person is a very close <laughs> relative to somebody who's very senior there. Who said to me, oh, Chairperson, you don't want a tender. Are you going to die poor? When? And I was like, why would you want me to pursue government business when I'm a public representative in government? When, when my job is supposed to be, because, you know, when you're just from opposition, you're like a board member. Mm. You can't really, you're not operational. Mm. You just sit on the board level and, gov and manage financial governance and other governance. 
and make sure that the department is doing what it should and make them account, open cases, investigate, na na na, pass laws, etc. And I was like, I can't do that to citizens of South Africa. I'm, I've been a taxpayer most of my working life. Mm. I hate the, you know, the amount of corruption and the abuse of our monies. You know, they're still subjected to a lot of racial you know, abuse in terms of income inequalities. You know, the apartheid wage gap is still there. Black women still earn, earn the least salaries, black men, etc., etc. You know, white people are still at the top. And so people are working hard, you know, uh, to earn their monies and to pay the payers you earn and other taxes. We are one of the most highly taxed citizens of the world. True. We pay over how many types of taxes in South Africa? There's a over lot. Over 100. There's a lot of taxes. I might be exaggerating, but the taxes we pay in South There's Africa are over 100. I think they could be over 100 different types of taxes that we pay. It's just not fair. And it's also not fair to us Africans. You know, we fought so long to basically get this measly political freedom. Mm. For people to just trash it like that. Mm. And then for them to make it so crass, just about their opulence, hey, what, what, you know, I must have a driver. Like, I can't afford a driver on this salary. I can't afford a driver, I drive <laughs> myself. And then we have a lecture, we talk, I don't have a driver, I don't have a driver. And I'm like, okay, so if I have a driver, so we are not governing in this party that I'm in. So must I go to EMEC, ANC? Then how am I going to oppose this person? Mm. This is how it's done. Mm. The future of the country? Look, I think the DA had an opportunity to do well. They're just very worrying because of the racist attitude that is obviously very blatant in how they govern themselves internally. It's worrying, you know. Nobody wants racism to come back. We acknowledge that white people built up a lot of skills. We must never deny that during apartheid. And they built good infrastructure. All the apartheid houses, most of <coughs> them in Emla, Ziwa Mashu, um, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in all the townships around uh, Durban, mm. uh, the houses are intact, however small they were. That's evidence that they did quality infrastructure. Quality. And so we need to we, we need to roll up our sleeves. We also need to accept that government is, is, is bankrupt. Uh, the misnomer of political parties fighting to take over government now. Uh, must, they basically need to remove the veil over their eyes. There's no money to loot anymore. Government is, is, is bankrupt. Mm -hmm. The amount of debt that the South African government... Look, I once asked uh, very senior smart guys in Treasury, National Treasury, how much debt do we have as South Africa? And can they break down that debt as government, mm -hmm. right? How, can they break that debt down into provinces? Which province owes how much? Which state agency owes how much? Which mm -hmm. municipality owes that? But I was asking them in the context of, of how they... You know what they said to me? Mm -hmm. We're very sorry, we can't tell you. <laughs> like, literally, they, literally wow. they had not computed it. They were like, okay, we can give you a ballpark figure for national government. Yeah. I was like, why would you not be able to tell us? Because me, na, with my bank, yeah. if I'm over indebted to the extent that I no longer can pay the debt, I can be sequestrated. Yes. So our government, what's going to happen? And, and the debt that we have accumulated is with governments. It's not just with the IMF and the World Bank. The 20 billion rand that was borrowed from to build the, this uh, how train what what improvement, mm. the it all thing was borrowed from the Austrian government, Yes. right? And I'm just making an example. Yes. Transnet borrowed a lot of money from France. Any state agency could just go to any country and borrow money from any government. We have got debt coming out of our ears. It's going to be inherited by future generations. Just in 2020 alone, our debt was 242 billion US. Yeah. Just in 2020. 2020 alone. How much debt do we have Cumulatively. last year? That was 2020, right? And that's national government debt, by the yes. way. Yeah. Sure. And let me tell you, South Africa's debt is just to China. <laughs> what? Oh my goodness. I'm not even talking about the IMF. To China as a country. Mm. Is it bigger than the debt that America owes China for rescuing them from the, the, the 2007-8... Um, financial the recession. Meltdown. They're saying South African state debt nears a hundred percent of estimate for fiscal year. Yeah. Sure. That's national government. Yeah. Municipalities went and looted through these um, loans. Uh, certain municipalities, metros, because the local municipalities are not allowed through law by law to apply for you, you know this VBS thing. 
Yes. What they did was completely not just irregular, it was just illegal, downright. They're not allowed to do that kind of stuff. When they want a loan, they must basically, it's like your daughter, mm. your child, eighteen. yes, legally, you sign a contract, but you can guarantee it. So it's the same thing. So basically the future of the country is such that we need to be realistic, we need to be honest, we need to understand what we are sitting with so that we know that when we say, okay, I'm contesting elections, I want to govern, how am I going to deal with the debt problem? How am I going to bring back jobs for South Africans? Millions of jobs have been lost in South Africa and they've not been recovered over the last 28 years. The first million jobs that were lost in South Africa was in 1996 when uh, under Tabo they started the, uh, the gear, not gear, the one before gear. Yeah, I think it was, it was gear. gear before RTP. Exactly. They never recovered those jobs. It's okay to lose jobs and then recover them <coughs> in another sector. Mm. We have now lost was it three million jobs in 2020 when, when, when Cyril did this reckless thing of shutting us down? There was no mm. need to shut us down. In between, we've been losing more jobs. We're sitting on 60% above unemployment. How are we going to bring the country back to productivity? So the reality is that we must have, uh, we must remove our blinkers and we must uh, acknowledge that we have a country to, to, to clean up. Uh, but more than anything, we need the electoral act to be adjusted because can't continue like this because they're going to carry on doing this under proportional representation mm -hmm. continue looting and every time you call them to order they just arrange a march to court you collapse a country by making sure that there's one man who, who does who shouldn't account mm. and when you force him to account and you take him to court to go and answer for his sins you just mobilize your members of your political party you make a noise you organize looting and then the question remains we might love these guys right we mm. might love Jacob Zuma uh, we might love Ace Mahashule, but the reality is that and I'm not saying others shouldn't go to jail, but we need to be realistic that when we take over the country, we take over debt, we're taking over basically non-existent uh, government-owned companies. Mm. They no longer exist. Uh, they've collapsed. They're finished. We have to start new industries. It's a reality. It's a fact. Is the ANC the solutions of the future? No, they in this can't country? be. They can't be because they themselves are struggling to clean themselves up. They can't pay their employees. Remember, they don't even. <clears throat> they can't pay it's, rent. It doesn't send a good message to they the country's youth, not just the youth, to the world, you know? But yeah, it's about, I mean, is, uh, I'm just thinking, Jobubuza, if the ANC is the future, and a lot of people keep saying it's not the ANC, but when they point to what you try these guys, a lot of the other guys they're pointing at are people that used to be in the ANC before. Yeah. That have either started their own parties or they sitting somewhere in a new party and we're going to shift to the exact same mindset. Which is why I'm saying if we want to continue with a democratic system, right, because we like democracy, we need to amend the Electoral Act. And so all that it's bigger of us, than just going for a political party. Exactly. The, the system itself must be changed. That it demands accountability and that it also makes sure that seats, whether it's a, a councillor or it's a, an MP, seats belong to a constituency. So if you are voted for by the people of Tembisa and we know that you require 10,000 votes in order for you to go to parliament, if something happens to you or you resign or you retire or something happens, that constituency must go back to elections mm. only. It may by election. One of, the, one of the arguments that came up during now when they were doing those fake consultations with the public for the electorate, they were trying to ram through very dodgy amendments mm. to satisfy the Constitutional Act and they didn't want to come through us as the litigants who succeeded in the matter. They said, yeah, but you're going to uh, you know, drive us into constant by-elections. They're like, but there's constant by-elections now mm. because you're shooting each other. Mm. You know, by have decided and regular political parties with if I go to offer a seat, but to the current ward councillor half and then there must be a, a by-election. And how many councillors do you have around the country? How many wards do you have in South Africa? 4,700 oh, and something. That's a lot. Right? Or 4,800. Let's say almost 5,000 wards, right? Mm. Yeah, I'm, I might be wrong, mm. but it's just under 5,000. How many MPs do you have? 400. Mm. So which, which, which uh, constituency, which framework gives you more by-elections? Mm. There's only 400 seats in parliament. Mm. Uh, bottom line is that people don't want accountability. People don't want quality. I mean, even the reason Baluela Lama position, it's also because one of the things we need to have in the Electoral Act, we need to have a criteria. Mm. We need to have a basic criteria. We can't keep on saying, 
Yes, I should peg and get apartheid, no, but no bandulu, no, but 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 no, so are poor people not getting their enough through education? Yes, NFSAS is a loan, but yeah. it, it's, it's, it's one that makes sure that it targets deserving children who come from families whose parents cannot afford to pay the fees. More pass, it turns into a grant. Especially if you get cum laude. I mean, more pass, Angie. Oh, more pass. More pass, oh, Angie. It converts from a loan to a grant. <laughs> So I think I must go and do my master's now. <laughs> Mandisa, one of the things I've been thinking about while you're speaking, because you, you use these terms, the PFMA, um, you used other terms, you speak about electoral reform, and the man out there just doesn't know what these things are. And I'm wondering, so I'm a kid watching this, I'm listening, I'm like, I really want to be involved. Like, what where do, do I, I start do? in learning how politics works, how the system works, and how I can be an active citizen. Because clearly that's the only way for us to increase the real knowledge of the people so that when we speak about these things, they understand exactly where they fit in the picture and they understand exactly what they, the individual, has to do to change the thing. So where do people go? Because, geez. Yeah, it, it is very daunting uh, for, 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 for children uh, today and the youth. But at the same time, you know, we don't want to be a, a population of excuses because mm. that's what's uh, making our underdevelopment worse. Good the internet, man. It's not good my internet. We literally had to walk to libraries, eh? And if there was no library in your section, yeah, there were libraries even during apartheid. We had to walk maybe mm. a few more sections. Uh, the the Bantu stands maybe could have been different. Yes. But they don't have to walk to libraries. The youth today also need to take responsibility. They also need to understand that this internet is actually there for their upliftment mm. and for their self-education. Every citizen, every human being on earth, as an African, by the way, we didn't commodify education. Mm. It, everything was orally transferred. Like I said, because of every day. Even childbirth, mm. uh, the indigenous way of giving birth, you stand because gravity will pull yes. the baby. But three months before you give birth, actually throughout the, the pregnancy, there's certain herbs you drink. Uh, there's certain herbs and oils that they rub you with to mm, make sure that the childbirth is, is, is easy. Yes. Right? But all of that we learned, we had that superior knowledge as Africans pre-colonial time without internet because we had oral transmission and we had self-education. When I is a boy, even a girl, if I wanted to hunt, mm. yes, I just go and join them at the time when they go food, hunting. like an apprenticeship. Your food, okay, my girl's a gala in the Gazaranjani is in Jazog Zingela. He lazy. We had such superior knowledge, we processed steel, we processed gold, mm. and we just didn't over consume, mm. we didn't stockpile because we know. Why stockpile? I can't hear. Mm. If I want it, I'll find it again. So our youth needs to take responsibility. They need to learn. They need to teach themselves stuff. But government is sitting on budgets. Like, for instance, the, 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 uh, and I'll come to the private sector. Let's take, for instance, you and other. Let's talk about the Electoral Act. The, the IEC is, has been, since 1994, given an education budget. I don't know what happens to that education budget. Mm. Somebody in the IEC, Wang Shebel, Uguti, Basically, by Iluta. So, comrades, by Iluta through the municipalities. They just pass it on to their friends in the municipalities. They call it education, but it basically ends up going back to these corrupt people. Workshop Nyan and Education. Because mm. I was having this fight with the IEC and I said, listen, telling somebody who would do a cross here, that's not education. It's not education. And that's not electoral education, and that's not democratic education. You need to tell somebody, okay, we are voter, right? You know what you must vote. We ask you to vote, but that's your business, fine. But the real democracy starts after you vote. You have a right to challenge a budget. You have a right to ask an MEC how much did you spend on this and that. You have a right to go and see 
who was appointed what as not to fight hey we're going to shut down this shut down that you know because even those business forum fights i'm affections were anc and so we need to do in-depth uh, so people need to understand what is proportional representation versus constituency-based uh, democratic system versus there's different forms. The countries actually sit down and decide on their own. There's no ideal system, by the way. Yes, we can make examples with the Scandinavian countries because they've made a success of not ever having a majority rule. Switzerland has never ever had a majority rule in the last hundred years. Hectic. All their governments are coalition. So nobody bullies anybody with their number. Majoritarianism is the most dangerous system you can have. Because basically majoritarianism says if there's a group of men who decide on a majority basis they want to gang rape me, mm. that's majoritarianism. And it's fine. They're going to rape me because the majority of them agree. That's majoritarianism. If the majority agrees that Asambe is your looter, you saw it. Baba mm. Isn't was, that democracy? Was that decision right? But isn't that democracy? But is our democracy is majoritarianism. Yes, but there must be a qualitative aspect to it. Thank you. And the qualitative aspect can only be brought in by the checks and balances. Yes, you must have majoritarianism, but it needs to be balanced. Because my, my concern is the most popular guy ends up being voted for because the majority of the There's citizens nothing wrong are not educated. Already the most popular party gets voted for mm. because the ANC has popularity based on its 100-year history. Mm. And it's our sentimental attachments as black people to them. And also our our dependency syndrome as Africans. We've, we've got a very uh, toxic uh, thing as he inherited uh, during the colonial era of being dependent. But yes, we can't be blamed because we were enslaved, you know. And so when you're a slave, you basically get taught to take instruction, mm. and stay put, stay here, and all mm. of that, right? But we need to snap out of that. Yeah. We need wow. to snap out of that. It was an incredible, incredible conversation. She has to come back, eh? Very, very well versed, very knowledgeable, very intelligent. Very intelligent. Oh. Totally, totally Flash amazing. It. <laughs> it's incredible to just listen to you speak and unpack certain things because one gets to learn, you know? Mm -hmm. w where are you going? I mean, before we wrap it up, I'd just like to know how does your future look like? You're still young, you're not 50 yet, there's still a long 50 life. 50 next year. Cheers! How oh, is it? <laughs> Coco. I'm 50 Cheers, next year. Coco. I'm not Coco, my a daughter. Age is in back. My daughter, my daughter hasn't given birth yet. Uh, yeah, on, no on my flight back from your own I so he puts a face. How? I just made sure which I'm totally puts a face yeah. because ear crack he puts a face. <laughs> <laughs> There's no amount of Botox as a Susa he puts a face. So, do you drink? I Sometimes. take alcohol, but I'm off it now because okay. I had gained so much weight, I needed to lose weight, and oh, so okay. one of the things I had to drop was alcohol. Well done on taking care of your body, body integrity. I have no choice. Yeah, instead of blame around to for jiving, you also must be yeah. responsible for your body. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm very big on natural yeah. and indigenous medicine and, you know, keeping your system alkaline and not putting toxins in your body and making sure that your gut is clear all Come the on. way. Solid. I've got an anti-inflammatory product. So, I, 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 so I, you're I, also a tree hugger? I'm a tree hugger, I tree told you. Tree international, she said. I'm a tree hugger. <laughs> as long as Ulima, you're a tree hugger. I mean, when I tell people about hugging trees, bang, to hug, but in your You have to. In fact, I'm a grounder. I learned how to ground. You need yeah. to be barefoot as often as possible. Yeah, people don't understand, but it's earth good. You, to it's earth good. Your body. It's good because when such conversations go to the fore, then young people get to learn. Yeah. You know, I actually was doing moment. a discussion with the. Uh, oh, Bri, and it's his birthday today. Aubrey Masang on 702. Oh, oh, happy birthday, happy Mr. Birthday, Aubrey. Yes. Big fan, big fan, brother, big fan. Very, very smart guy, very astute. Intelligent. Yeah. Very Actually, very we need smart. to have Aubrey here. Yeah, you do. Aubrey yeah, Masang, yeah. we need you here, bro. Yeah. Aubrey, you know I used to call on your show. I haven't spoken yeah. to you in a while. We need you here. Brilliant yeah. guy. So me and him were doing, just before the COVID thing, and some indigenous health, this and that stuff. So I'm very passionate about that. I actually, um, well, at some point, I need to start manufacturing. Uh, I, based on my own uh, illnesses, I started um, balls and other components to uh, reduce inflammation in my body, mm -hmm. to uh, improve um, circulation, blood circulation, to uh, uh, prevent water retention. 
Mm. All those three things are the basis for all illnesses. Mm. And I then manufacture this product. I pulled it off because I started manufacturing it, but not large, just for small markets. But I realized that I was in the wrong target market. So now I've sort of reorganized it. So I'm very big on that. Um, like I said, I want to go into recycling. Um, yeah, I need seven million rand. Actually, anybody who knows a panda <laughs> can give I me need seven, seven million, million rand to start my recycling. Uh, it's a very novel um, uh, piece of equipment that I got from some German guys I'm talking to. So once I have the seven million, I'm getting go. I'm getting on the road with it. But I want to uh, target one of the small municipalities in the Eastern Cape or in KZN or in Pumalanga for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, and then um, also it's a very novel idea. But yeah, and then there's the Afro Womanist Movement, which I'm passionate about, which is really an economic, uh, you know, an economic struggle um, uh, movement because you you can't uh, li li liberate yourself as a woman if you're not economically mm -hmm. uh, liberated. But of course, we will support uh, once we start winning that struggle as an organization. We will support independent candidates because I'm also passionate about the electoral reforms thing, and obviously, South Africa needs to move beyond its uh, corruption uh, malaise right now. And yeah, there's a few other projects that I might be collaborating with with other people. And so, yeah, there's a lot going on. Like a lot, lot. lot Still very busy. On. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to see you. It's great to hang out with you. It's great to learn from you. And um, I'd like to big up Peñol for, for putting this one together. Incredible, brother. Actually, we need more sisters because um, we read on the previous episode's comments, a lot of people are complaining. Guys, come yeah. on. You can't just be a boys club. We need sisters with brains here. Because what I love about a lot of our, our audiences is what people are saying out there is that I think what they're enjoying about our podcast is it's information that is appealing to sure. certain audience members. It's not, it's not just entertainment sure. or it's not gossip. Sure. So people watch for the aspect of being um, mentally stimulated somehow. Yeah. And a lot of people would like to see more sisters. It's so I'm must, saying big up for bringing a sister with such brains because these are the type of people who get us to learn, you know? Sure. To no, digest them up and that. Thank you very much, Mandis. I think I just want to add on to the part about electoral reform and political education. From my side, um, I believe that who you vote for with your end and who you vote for with your labor yeah. is more important than who you vote for politically because those people take love that. your labor, they take your money and they buy the supposed politicians that uh, oppress you and loot from you today. Yes. So just be very, very conscious of who you spend your money with and who you yeah. give your labor to. Yeah. You fix that, it's game over. Last words to our audiences is Mandisa. Well, I don't know, like, I really am hoping and praying that this pandemic can just come to a freaking end. I like this, it's called a pandemic. <laughs> and that they can stop manipulating us. By the way, South Africa is not the only country that's trying to ram through these regulations. Australia is mm. trying to do it, many other countries. Sure, Australia has been a hectic during these times. Yeah. And of course, we need to work hard, all of us. We need to work together, come together and rebuild the economy. It's not going to rebuild itself. We need to lose confidence in the government. At some point, we need to call for tax boycott. Oh, I like that one. Because our taxes are really just going to Weaves and Ferraris. Sure. A lot of the things that you said today, <laughs> I don't think the government it's not, not gonna like or it. the ANC government is going to like it. Do you, do you think they like you or maybe? Mm, I was a member of the ANC at some point. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I consulted for them as well okay. when they were in a crisis, I think in Limpopo with their comms. Um, they know how I feel about them. I'll never hate the ANC because my family, a lot of my family are from the ANC. Um, at some point they were genuine. I can't hate them. Anyway, the ANC is just a logo. Mm. The people in the ANC, yes. especially the ordinary members, are the ones that break my heart. Mm. Because they allow all these crazy things to happen. So I don't think they like me. Well, look, some of them love me because maybe I'm lovable. <laughs> and because we were comrades before at some point. But because they know I despise their corruption. And I loathe their lack of uh, pride in themselves. Uh, by trashing our country and bringing us to the level of all these other African countries that are just useless. Mm. Um, as Trump called them, shit old countries. Jeez. Yeah, we're bigger right, Shem. Let's be honest. You? So... <laughs> Bottom line is, I don't care whether they love me or they hate me. You know, I, I, the sooner we see their behinds and we start seeing a new order 
in the political landscape of South Africa. One it's question there. I forgot to ask before the end of this interview. I didn't ask you on um, your take on Im uh, South African immigration rules, immigration laws. Look, I haven't read immigration laws in, in detail and I don't like commenting, especially on laws, because I, I like to read my laws, okay. you know. Uh, but I do know that because we benchmark a lot of our stuff on British laws, American laws, and basically the Commonwealth mm. environment, I do know we have very tight immigration laws. The problem are the people at the border posts mm. and the people at the airports and the people at the ports. Because, you know, I worked for a port, I worked for an airline, I worked for an airport. Mm. So I understand that space quite well. A lot of the weaknesses are coming through. You know, we used to get a lot of people coming through the port in Durban uh, illegally through, um, you know, the ships and stuff. And, we, you, you know, the nonsense that happens at the airports, the drug dealing and the smuggling. It's the people. You know, we have also become corrupt. We can't just blame yes. the politicians. Yes. We as South Africans are corrupt. We buy stolen goods from people. We ask for, we, 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 we entice people with bribes to get tenders ourselves. Yes. Um, we engender corruption. We participate in it. We're a corrupt society. True. You know. Yeah. And so our immigration laws are actually very tight. I was listening to Aaron Saledi the other day and he was explaining it, I think, to JJ. Yeah. And I realized that, okay, I haven't read a lot of the immigration laws, but we have tight laws. Mm. The problem is that as is tanned, we don't love ourselves. We, you know, we don't love each other. Mm. We allow a criminal to come through the border. What, what do we think that person is going to do to our country? Mm. Other countries don't allow that nonsense. Mm. And so I don't think, in South Africa, the problem is never the laws. Eh? Right the now people. they're trying to change the Health Act. There's nothing wrong with the Health Act. They're trying to ram through NHI. Mm. They know they can't do NHI. I mean, <laughs> they know it. <laughs> so our laws are not the problem. It's implementation of our laws. It's governance. It's oversight, like I said. It's civilian oversight uh, over our, our, all our systems. It's, it's the, the corruption in the police, in home affairs, in customs, in uh, all these other agents that work around the ports of entry, whether it's air, rail, water, whatever, road, you know. So we need to enforce our immigration laws. Uh, step grandfather one was a, a Malawian who came through with the wars, one of the wars where, you know, the apartheid government would go and collect people from SEDEC to fight, I think it was the Second World War. Uh, and there's nothing, you know, we, 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 we can't ask for borderlessness. I mean, I tried to explain this to someone. We were nations here with kings and queens. Mm. Why did we have different queens, kings and queens mm. if we didn't have borders? You don't just Ubu get into a kingdom, Ubu Bangla, you can't say there are no borders where. Mm. Even if you want to go to South Africa, mm. we had our own system of receiving. Yes. We would give them a piece of land and help them to, you know, uh, assimilate. Uh, and likewise. But at that time, we respected mm. one another. There was common respect. There's no common respect. We can't have people coming through our borders with drugs and arms and uh, these gangs who steal children and human trafficking, human trafficking and prostitution and, and basically right now what's happening is that I was told by a police officer that majority of the murders that are committed in South Africa are committed by foreign nationals and specifically Zimbabweans. I asked him why don't you share this in public? Hi, but is xenophobic. But if it's a fact and you can prove it through the stats. There's no xenophobia in stats and facts. I just want to add. This Try is, going this to Zimbabwe where now without the. the and in Zimbabwe, I've heard that they are very strict. Yeah, yeah, the prisons there. Are okay, Buzu Vavi. Remember when Vavi was sent back by Mkabe? Yeah. I just want to. I just want to add. Is my, 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 my friend Vavi, by the way. I just want to add and shade that Njobu Kulum about kings and and kingdoms, kingdoms. Yeah. yeah. Um, where you couldn't just get in. A lot of our political leaders who are preaching about removing borders live within spaces and estates where people can't just come in as and when so if they are living like that why would they allow a country to just remove borders when they themselves in their but homes why, why and their estates don't want us, to do that so if, if, uh, it's if silly for me if you believe in that kind of uh why why are we all living in, in gated estates why yes. do we have cameras in our houses if it's okay for someone to just move into the country without being verified without contributing to the productivity of the country and also you can't there's no country in the world that will allow millions and millions of people to come and take low-hanging fruit jobs from their own poor people yes who want to go to another country because i've got a scarce skill that they don't have 
Ladies and gentlemen, Mandi sa mashir, Mandi sa smongile, mashir. Smongile, smongile. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Well done, bro. Good Spura. episode. Thanks a lot. I think this was our longest episode so far. It feels. Like I can imagine. Yeah, but I love uh, listening to people with insights just speak, and sometimes people say, "No, guys, ask this, ask that." Sometimes sure. you just want to listen and learn. Sure. I've got a lot of questions for Mandisa, but yeah, geez, we could go on for five hours. But for now, you're fine with everything you've asked? I'm happy. Because he's coming back in the next couple of months. I'm happy. Months or weeks, we'll see. Sure. But thank you very much, guys. (laughs) We'll see you on the next video. Love and blessings. Thank you, Siabong. VM. Mkuku. This is The Hustler's Corner.